This is a production of Cornell University. All right, so thank you for showing up today and thank you for giving me a chance to talk to you about my research. Um, as Joyce said, I work for the USDA up in Geneva and I work on grapevines. My position is a, as a research geneticist. In the USDA, we have these specific sort of regions that we work on and mine is abiotic stress tolerance. And because of our location in Western New York, the, the most important abiotic stress from grapevine's point of view is winter stress, cold stress. So here you can see a vineyard just south of <clears throat> Geneva in the middle of winter and you can see that it's very beautiful it's a really fun place to work if you have the appropriate clothing um, but from the vines point of view this is very stressful and so there's no there's no canopy there's no foliage the vine shut down and it's doing its very best to survive the complexity of winter temperatures and make it to, to spring so we're going to go over a whole bunch of concepts but that's the basic overwhelming um, part of my talk is how do grape vines make it through winter before we go very far, I just want to acknowledge my uh, student, Al Kovaleski. A lot of what I'm going to present today has come out of his thesis. He's really pushed this program in a way that I didn't, didn't think it was going to go. And it's been really great. So he's, he's the brawn behind this and the brain behind most of this talk. <clears throat> so we're going to introduce grapevine. Vitus vinifera is the cultivated form of grape that gives us these four wonderful uh, end products at the base here. That was advancing the slide. Here you go, wine, table grapes, juice grapes, and raisins. Um, the vast majority of global production comes from this one species. This species was domesticated from its wild ancestor, Sylvestris, in the Mediterranean region of Europe. And this is important to us from a winter temperature point of view and an adaptation point of view, because if you look at what the minimum temperatures along the Mediterranean coast are, um, you can see that they're not that bad. Um, red and orange is negative one to four C for red. And so these are, these are very mild winters from our perspective. So we have a hot, dry summer, cool, mild winter. And so there's not a lot of need for strong freeze resistance in these, uh, in Vitus vinifera. It still doesn't do a bad job of surviving winter. It can survive to temperatures about negative 13 F. I'm gonna primarily speak in Celsius because that's how we take our measurements. Um, so negative 25 degrees Celsius is sort of the limit, negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit. So we care about cold hardiness because temperature is one of the leading factors that limit where we can grow the crops that we grow and, and for sure for grapevines. So here you can see in this uh, map, this little black star in the top right corner, that's Geneva. And this arc is the 44th north latitude that goes through France and Italy. So our latitude is comparable with the Mediterranean. As you can see by the color graph, we're nowhere near that red and brown coloring. It's much colder here. The value of the New York grape industry is somewhere between 52 and $70 million. And if we have a really bad winter, you can suffer up to $50 million worth of damage. And that depends very much on the type of winter, where it strikes. Um, if you go into the Midwest, they can have almost complete crop loss from a bad winter. Uh, in New York, we tend to grow grapes in very specific regions. And the bottom map here in purple are the primary wine regions. There's two colors of purple. I'm not sure if you can see the lavender, but if you look at the hardiness map, those purple areas overlap completely with the green areas in the hardiness map. And that's because we grow cultivated grape right on its margin. We're at a spot where you cannot be sure that Vitus vinifera will survive every single year. <clears throat> Low temperature associated stresses affect Vitus vinifera globally. So here's a map in purple are high frost risk areas. And so with this particular aspect of cold hardiness, we're talking about the buds breaking early in spring before the last threat of frost has passed. If you have a frost, it freezes off your growing tissues, which includes your flowers, it means no crop. So you can see it affects it globally. But this interplays a lot with the way that global climate is starting to shift. So here, pictured in red areas in California, the Northeast, and in Europe, are areas where we grow grapes now, or could grow grapes now climatically, that are expected to get too hot in the summer to produce grapes. And they're going to shift towards these blue areas in each case. When you shift north, that may give us the right summer temperatures, but that puts us at risk of more winter temperatures, because it doesn't necessarily mean warmer all the time. We have seen that winters are getting warmer about, in our region, about one degree uh, Fahrenheit per decade. And so from 1970, 
we've warmed by about five or six degrees Fahrenheit. If you look at the trend of the minimum winter temperatures, it is also going up. And so it's getting warmer and our winter extremes are getting less. But I also want to point out here that the range in winter's extreme, winter extremes goes from negative 19 to six degrees. So while it may be warmer overall, the variation in those killing events is still very high. So when you put those together, it becomes very problematic for consistent grapevine production. This plays into how global change and warming winters affects um, the risk of freeze events. Normally, um, a strong jet stream protects Arctic air, it keeps it trapped at the poles. But as we warm in winter, particularly in the Arctic, that jet stream gets weaker, which is shown here, and that Arctic air can break out more often. And we see that manifest here in this thermograph. This was the polar vortex, when polar vortex became a thing again, a couple of years ago, um, we had this breakout of polar air, breakout of polar air that plunged down through the Midwest, caused a lot of damage and a lot of crops. And this is the sort of event that will kill grapes because if they get a mild winter, they're not prepared for this drastic switch. The way that we have been dealing with this challenge on the margins is by breeding new cold hardy hybrids. And so we use wild grapevine species in the genus Vitus. And in North America, there's probably about 20 different varieties. And in Asia, there's probably another 40. Pictured here are some distribution maps for different wild grape species. And this is some pictures of the fruit. Um, we typically use Vitus riparia, which hopefully you can tell the difference in the green here. The lime green is the, the county level distribution. It's a very widespread species that goes well up into Canada. It happens to be one of the most cold hardy species that survives the coldest temperatures. And wild grape can survive to around <coughs> negative 35 to negative 40 C. So that's about a 10 to 15 degree C increase in ability to survive winters. So all of our cultivar improvement for freeze resistance comes from these wild species. We can't breed cold hardiness out of vinifera. It simply doesn't have the tools. So we talk about winter, it's also very complex. Uh, we're talking about half of the year at least, maybe about eight months, it extends from fall through the dormancy period of winter into spring bud burst. During the time, during this whole time, we have a number of different cold related stresses. Frost is very important in the fall and in the spring. If you get an early frost in the fall, you can defoliate the vine and that cuts off its ability to prepare for winter. If you get a frost in the spring, you lose, um, sorry about this, you lose your floral tissue. You can also have cold extremes throughout the winter. And if the vine isn't prepared in early, mid or late winter, you can suffer bud damage, and that has the same effect as killing the flowers. We typically represent this as a lethal temperature, and it follows this shape throughout winter. The ability to survive freezing increases in early winter, it's maintained through midwinter, and then lost quickly in the spring. So we call this acclimation, maximum hardness or, or maintenance, and deacclimation. So these are the two major concepts for today dormancy and cold hardiness. Dormancy is the period of the vine basically being asleep, <coughs> keeping its growth from occurring during temperatures that are not um, growth permissible. It's necessary for grapevine to go through this for it to have synchronous bud burst and synchronous flowering in the spring. And the other concept is cold hardiness, which is very complex, but it involves freeze hardiness, freeze tolerance, supercooling, a bunch of different factors that all go into the general idea of the vine survives all the freezing events of that year. Um, so we do all of our work on dormant wood and specifically with the bud. And so these are cuttings of grape, each cut into a single node. And so there's a little bud here. We'll see some zooms in, zoom ins later, but we do all of our work taking samples from the field and then doing growth chamber experiments. So the primary aspect of my research program is twofold. Actually describing the phenotype of what cold hardiness is, because this is something that's super complex and we need to be able to target aspects of it. And I think of it as four things. How does the vine prepare for winter? How does it prevent changes in physiology that result in growth? How does it survive sub-freezing temperatures? And then how does it time bud burst in the spring? So those four factors are the phenotypes. As from the genetic point of view, we want to know what the genetic architecture of all these traits are. What we know from all abiotic stresses is that it's polygenic, lots of different genes playing roles. And if we look at other literature, we see that cold often 
uses the same stress pathways as salt, drought, heat, and ABA exposure. And so basically the idea is that all these abiotic stresses activate a suite of transcription factors that activate an even larger suite of downstream genes to cause changes in the plant. And so we expect a lot of crosstalk when we start un unraveling some of the genes behind this. We expect to find things for drought and for um, salinity. So if we cover a little bit of some of these terms, just so we're all on the same page, we want to talk a little bit about dormancy and chill chilling requirement. The bud is a really interesting um, entity in that it is isolated from the rest of the vine during the winter. It's sealed off, and it is able to measure the length of winter. It measures it through some sort of clock system that we don't quite understand, but that clock runs between 0 and 11 degrees Celsius. And so when the temperatures outside drop below 11 degrees Celsius, the bu buds start counting. When it drops below freezing, they stop. Over the winter, they need to accumulate a certain amount in order to be ready to grow in the spring. And so if you go out to the field and you grab a cutting while this clock is running and you put it in the greenhouse, it won't grow. This is called endodormancy, a specific type of dormancy, so internal dormancy where physiology, some physiological parameter is suppressing growth. At some point, the clock is fulfilled and the buds transition to something called ecodormancy, where if you go and you take that bud and then remove it from the field, say in February, it's still too cold to grow, but you put it inside, it'll now grow. So this suppression has been released, and now dormancy is enforced by the temperature. These two different interactions, these two different dormancy parameters. The length of that brown bar, the endodormancy barrier, can be determined by genetic differences. So different species can have different amounts of that clock. And it can also be determined by the environment. So if you have a very cold location, the clock needs to run a long time because you don't spend a lot of time in that temperature zone. If you have a very mild climate, the clock is always running. So that arrow, relatively speaking, gets smaller. This is important because if you transition to this eco-dormant state in an area that gets late winter snap freezes, you can damage the vine. So once it moves into this um, eco-dormant state, it's much more sen sensitive. We measure this by taking cuttings, uh, putting them into a growth chamber, giving them doses of chill, and then seeing how long it takes them to grow. And when, they're fully, when their chilling requirement is fully met, they'll all burst synchronously. When it's not fully met, you get asynchronous burst. This is a problem in the field because if you get asynchronous burst, you get asynchronous flowering and fruiting. And farmers don't like to have to harvest at multiple times. Data-wise, if you plot the days of bud burst versus the chilling hours, you get this relationship. The more chilling that a vine gets in that clock region, the faster it gets at growing. If you also look at it this way, it also gets more synchronous. So these two parameters are combined. So when you're planting a certain variety, you have to keep dormancy and the chilling requirement in mind because not all varieties can be grown everywhere from this standpoint alone. If you look at the chilling hours that accumulate across the United States, you can see here in, in Western New York, we get lots, 1,500 hours. That's because we've got the Great Lakes, the Finger Lakes, and the ocean nearby. It makes us very mild. If you look in North and South Dakota, they have less chilling hours than we do, even though their winter is much harsher than us. It's because that clock is, is stopped. It's below freezing. So if you plant a high chill variety in North or South Dakota, it's not going to break bud on time. The same thing happens when the South is too warm and we don't get a peach harvest. If you don't get enough chilling for peaches, for apples, for all these different fruit crops, you won't get synchronous bursts and synchronous fruiting. If we just look quickly at two years, 2012, 2013 was warm for us. We had 1,600 hours of chill by the end of the winter, whereas in South Dakota, at the same time point, they only had 1,000. So here you would be able to plant varieties that have chilling hours um, that require a lot of chilling, but if you plant it in South Dakota, it wouldn't work. If you go to a cold year, you can see that here we lost 300 hours. So we have to be very aware of the chilling requirements of the crops that we plant because you can inadvertently plant something that's not going to, to do well here from a production point of view. If we then look at different wild grapevine species, we see that that response is shared across all wild species. All wild species get faster at growing with increasing chill but their position on the y-axis, both at the start of winter and at the end, 
is different. And so there are differences in the chill response, high, medium, and low. And if we look at them geographically by the distribution, it looks like southern species typically need longer winters than northern species. This seems like a bit of a paradox because you would think that a northern species would want to be prepared for a long winter, but this is from the point of view of that clock. So a northern winter is actually a very short clock winter. Does that make sense? So what we see here is a potential adaptive trait based on, on geography. So we can now target these different species for different dormancy chilling requirement aspects. And I'm gonna bring your attention back to riparia because we use riparia a lot for cold hardiness. You can see that it's on the uh, northern distribution, low chill response side. In the germplasm in Geneva, I have access to lots of different accessions from across the country. And so we looked at 43 of these. And if we group them into southern and northern groups and you squint a little bit at it, you can see that the blue is on the lower side and the, and the orange is on the upper side. So it looks like, and then this, the color coding is preserved here in this column, it looks like things from the south tend to have slightly longer dormancy. So it looks like that species level distribution north to south is possibly preserved within widely dispersed species as well. So there may be a gradient within riparia for the same trait. So this is cool because now we have riparias that we can use to breed for longer winters. And we want that for up here because we have what, what the clock thinks is a really long winter. So we're now working with the grapevine breeder in Cornell to use some of this material for breeding rather than choosing the stuff from Manitoba, which is believed to be very cold hardy, but has a very short requirement. So dormancy protects the buds from growing when the temperatures are lethal. There's two parts of dormancy um, to protect against temperature. And there's one portion where it's protecting against temperature and there's another portion where it's very responsive to temperature. The dormancy level and the chilling requirement is important for where, what types of cultivars you plant. And it looks like there's a geographic gradient for this trait. So that's kind of cool to me from a sort of like a natural adaptation, natural evolution kind of point of view. The other part of my research that overlaps with dormancy is the ability of the bud to survive freezing events. This is a picture of a grapevine bud that has been cut and then split open. Okay, so this is the base of the bud here. And this is sort of like the decapitated top of the bud. Right in the center there is a dead primary bud. There's a, there's, it's a compound bud. There's three um, buds in there, the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary. The primary is the weakest and has the floral tissue for the next year. In this particular picture, you can see the primary is dead and oxidized and the secondary and tertiary are still alive. So this had a precise cold treatment that killed only the primary. We can determine the temperature that kills the primary through this um, differential thermal analysis method. So we cut the bud off of the cane, we put them in these um, little chambers, in these plates, and then put the plates in a programmable freezer. We slowly freeze the buds, and we measure voltage across that plate. And basically what we're doing is we're measuring the freezing of water. So as temperature decreases, there's this large spike in voltage as external water freezes. This is a heat release, which changes the voltage of the plate. As um, the extracellular water freezes over time, as the temperatures are decreasing, the bud is surviving all of this, presumably dehydrating at some point, it's still alive. And as long as you go back and forth between these two stages, freezing and thawing, it's fine. Only when that internal water freezes, is it lethal. And that's what we measure here. These little spikes are five primary buds dying. We take the average of that and then we can plot the survivability through winter. That's what I'm showing here. So here's temperatures. These two curves down here in purple and green are Cab Sauv and Riesling, two vinifera varieties. And you can see that U-shaped curve I showed you earlier, acclimation, maintenance, and deacclimation. So each of these points are the average of the, the lethal events for those buds. <clears throat> Part of what we're doing is trying to understand how the buds are changing through winter because we want to understand how to maximize their ability. And there are some really cool models that have come out where they're trying to predict bud hardiness so that farmers have a tool for when they need to go out and make viticulture modifications to deal with cold events. The best current model is this Ferguson model. And what I want to show you here is how bad the Ferguson model is 
in the east. It works really great in Washington state where it was developed on like 23 different cultivars. What you see here in black is actual data and then in orange is the prediction. You can see that it has problems in both the early and late parts of winter in over predicting hardiness. This is a problem if you're using this as a farming tool. And it also has a hard pan. It can't, the buds can't gain hardiness past a certain level. So we're working with this model and the different aspects of cold hardiness to try to correct it and then also learn a bit more about the phenotype. What I'm showing here are three years of data for three different species. In blue is Vitus vinifera. In green and yellow are Vitus riparii and Vitus emurensis. Those two species are very cold hardy, one from North America, one from Asia. In 2012, 2013, it's a very warm year. Oh, well, actually, before we get into that, let's look at some general trends. What we see with our data, our cold hardiness data, is that when you have a cold event in winter, the buds tend to respond by gaining cold hardiness. When you have a warming event, they tend to respond by losing cold hardiness. But it's not always true at all points in the winter. So you can see in this particular year, the first cold event resulted in acclimation. The second cold event only resulted in acclimation in the yellow cultivar. In this year, the, the trend is reversed. The first cold event had no effect, the second one did. So we're trying to figure out what, what makes these cold events different? What is the vine actually cueing off of? If we look it looks at like there was a little more integrated cold in the middle one. You mean they're all working together, doing the same thing? Uh, well, it looks like the environment was a little colder in the middle one than in the right one. Is that? Oh, here. Yeah. Um, well, between these three years, they're actually three perfect, perfect comparisons. This is a very warm year. We had one cold event. This, uh, this is the freezing point here, and these are minimum temperatures. In this year, we had very punctuated winter. Very cold, warm, very cold, warm. And this year we had tremendous sustained cold. I'm not sure if you, if you were all here for this, but this was like the two and a half months of nothing but freezing. So they're very different winters from the vine's point of view. If you look at Amurensis' maximum cold hardiness across those three years, what I want you to notice is it moves. And each year it's in a different position and arrow points to the, the point in winter when it was at max. And you can see that that arrow moves as well. If you look at the other two varieties now in comparison, you can see if you phenotype for this trait in a warm year, there's no difference between these three species. If you use a punctuated year, vinifera suddenly looks sensitive and the two wild species look tolerant. And then if you go to a very cold year, you start seeing separation across all three species. This makes it really challenging to study from a, the point of view because so much of the phenotype is derived from the environment. So the type of winterness, the type of winter is determining the cold hardiness in any given year. The other thing to note is that the buds don't automatically supercool or gain the maximum amount of freeze hardiness in every year. They need to be pushed. So it's not an automatic on off switch. Um, we, want, we still wanna understand what the genetic architecture of this trade is though, because we need to provide tools to the farmers. So we did the same thing as I did with the dormancy. We looked at 43 different riparias to see if we could understand what's going on. This is what the data looks like. It's 43 different curves through winter. If you take all of that data and you load it into some mod statistical modeling, you can get a simplified version of what's going on. And so that's what I'm showing here. In blue is the least hardy riparia, in yellow is the most hardy riparia, and there's about five degrees of tolerance difference in those two uh, genotypes. The other 41 accessions are somewhere in between. So the interesting thing here is if you, you ask, ask the statistical model, is there, is there significant differences between the most and least cold hardy? There is in this five degree parameter, but not in the shape of the curve. So that means that at any one point in the winter, the least hardy and the most hardy are responding to temperature perception in the same way. They're gaining relatively amount the same relative amount of their phenotype, both down and up in response to temperature. So it's not really, we're not really seeing a difference here in a cold hardiness trait. We're seeing a difference in something that happens before we start this experiment. We start this experiment as soon as the leaves fall in the, in the fall. So what we think is going on is that the time that these vines are shutting down is the time that they start tracking temperature and they're able to take advantage of cues telling them to go cold hardy. And I use the analogy of 
of starting on a track race where some runners start out ahead. And instead of them all looping around and doing the same distance, imagine it's just a straight line. So whoever starts winter first has the greatest potential for cold hardiness in that year. If we, if we run the model backwards, so now we're just <coughs> guessing at what's going on, we see about a two week difference in when we think these vines are going to sleep in the fall. So now we're starting to turn our eyes away from this particular part of the trait and more towards this part. Another thing I wanna bring up here is an interesting observation that has come out of viticulture literature. If you spray a vine with ABA when the fruit is setting, you can actually induce cold hardiness. But the interesting thing you do is you induce it in a parallel fashion. So if you spray a variety with ABA, it goes dormant a little bit earlier and it gains cold hardiness throughout the winter in a parallel fashion, much like we're seeing here. So it might be some evidence that this early acclimation, early dormancy is what we really need to be looking at. So from a genetics point of view and a genetic mapping point of view, the question is how do you work with this trait? Because it's, it's an unwieldy crop. It's highly in, influenced by the environment. Um, when we make crosses, because the winters are severe here, we're always crossing sort of a moderately cold hardy by a very cold hardy. So our phenotypic separation is really bad. We really wanna be making this cross. So the way that we've approached it in my group, because I can't grow sensitive vines here, they'll die every year, is to break it down into bits. So if we just focus on the acclimation, we wanna understand how do cold events trigger gains of cold hardiness. Some things that we know, colder winters give you more hardiness. So colder temperatures should give you more hardiness. We wanna know if all temperatures trigger acclimation in the same way, and if we can develop any new phenotyping. So if you do this as a thought experiment, if you take dormant cuttings from the field and you put them into different growth chambers and you give them different temperatures, you should see differences in acclimation. That's what's pictured here. So maybe we just phenotype all in the growth chamber. When we look at what happens if we do that with Chardonnay in this case, so this is Chardonnay in the field, this is Chardonnay in the growth chamber at two and seven. We see that there's, although there's a separation there in those best fit lines, there's no actual difference between these two responses. If we look at the temperature in this first two data points, we see that in the field it was seven degrees Celsius on average. So it should be like the yellow line, but we see acclimation, so we're missing something. So if we look at what temperature looks like in the field, here's the seven average, we're actually seeing a lot of movement, right, around that seven average. So maybe it's the temperature swing. So we did the experiment put them in a growth chamber with an average seven with a five degree swing, just like outside. So here's the data in static temperature. Here's the data in static versus cycle. So this is really cool. They all gained cold hardiness, and this is a significant gain of cold hardiness if you cycle the temperature. So they're not paying attention to the average temperature, but there's something about the lows and highs that is signaling to the vine to gain cold hardiness. The other neat thing that's here is the two so this is at two degrees Celsius, and then we moved it into a cycling chamber, which means we actually moved it into a warmer environment because the mean is now seven, and it gained cold hardiness. So it's actually blind to static temperatures. They don't do anything. From this, we're able to come up with a new parameter called uh, sigma t. So it's basically looking at the fluctuations in temperature. And when we add that to the model, we fix the acclimation problem here. So what they're missing in the Washington model that we have here is that erratic high-low cycling. In Washington, it's much more constant. So now what we're doing is now that we know how to actually make them acclimate, we're trying to look at the uh, gene expression profiles that are going on during this process. So we're collecting the tissues now because we finally sort of narrowed in on the temperatures at work. So that'll be, I'll come back and talk in a couple years, let you know how that goes. <laughs> The other side of this is deacclimation, and deacclimation is, is a little bit easier to understand. Here it's the response to vines to warm temperature. If we look at, um, oh, I bring up chilling hours again, because as you gain chilling hours, you gain faster growth. And if we look at the budburst phenotype in a, a growth chamber, what we're actually looking at is, is two things combined. It's how fast it takes to grow, but it, we're also looking at how much time it takes to lose cold hardiness to get to a growth 
state, right? So it's two parts. If we look at the number of days to lose cold hardiness, we see this sort of relationship. That if you test at several different temperatures, so you take cuttings, you put them in different growth chambers, you measure how fast do they lose hardiness, we see a linear response at any one temperature. So this is a lot easier than the cycling. <coughs> if we look at our, again, our curve, and this box indicates the temperatures where chilling accumulates. If you go out to the field and collect material throughout winter, at this point, and you put it in a warm temperature and you try to deacclimate, it won't deacclimate. It will not lose cold hardiness. As you go through winter, that changes. It, the longer winter goes, the more chilling that goes, the deacclimation becomes faster at that given temperature. And so what we're seeing is this relationship between chill accumulation and deacclimation speed. Whereas you are always capable of deacclimating, but in the beginning, you're really, really slow. And the reason we're using planes is because I don't have a mathematical mind and I have to work with cartoons to understand this. <laughs> but basically, at the beginning of winter, deacclimation is like a plane taxiing. It's moving, but it's moving really, really slow. As it gains chilling, it takes off, and then it meet, uh, makes its maximum speed. What we think is going on is these sections represent those eco dormancy or endodormancy transition and eco dormancy periods. The other thing to note about this is while these are linear responses, the rate at low temperature is lower than the rate at high temperature. So if you're deacclimating at a low temperature, you're deacclimating at a lower optimal rate. So full speed depends on the airplane. The rate of deacclimation depends on the temperature you're deacclimating at. So if we look at Cabernet Sauvignon and you deacclimate it at 10 degrees Celsius, as, chills, as chilling accumulates, you can see this response. It'll lose about half a degree of hardiness per day. But if you deacclimate it at 22 degrees Celsius, it'll lose one and a half. So it's not a linear relationship based on temperature. The other th interesting thing is if you look at cultivar differences, Riesling deacclimates a little bit faster at 10C and a lot faster at 22C. So depending on this profile, we'll give you an idea of how fast you'll break in the spring. because It's a reflection of how you're responding to warming temperatures. If we take those parameters, now cultivar specific deacclimation parameters, and plug them into the model, we fix the tail end of the model. So we've captured the two portions of this response that are unique. Well, it's not unique to the Northeast. We see it in the Northeast because our temperatures are more variable. The other thing I want to show you is how this compares to other species. So here's Cabernet Sauvignon again, 10 and 22. Here's Riesling. If you look at Vitis amurensis, so this is the wild species they use for cold hardy breeding in Asia, it deacclimates at 10C at the same rate as Cab Sauv does at 22. It's incredibly timed. As soon as there's the slightest bit warming, it gets ready to break bud. This is a serious problem if you include this trait in a hybrid in, in an area like New York. At 22C, it's, it's off the charts. Riparia, which is our, our favorite cold hardy species in North America, is also faster than Riesling and Cab Saab. It's not as, not as fast as Vitis amurensis. But if you look at it at 22C, it catches up. So the relative differences between these species, are, it's really interesting too, to see that there are different components of this phenotype itself. What we learned from this, from a genetic mapping kind of uh, approach, is that we now have a phenotype that we can look at if we're trying to select for increased responsiveness to temperature or decreased responsiveness to temperature. Typically here, we want decreased response so that we don't have early bud burst. But for table grapes in Southern California, they want deacclimation at really, really rapid deacclimation because they don't have long winters. So we, we now know we want a phenotype at around 1,500 hours of chill. Um, but we also see that northern species are bringing along, along with cold hardiness, they're bringing along this rapid deacclimation phenotype that we don't really want. So we now have to somehow break those two things apart if that's possible. How this bears out when you look at data. So now this is the same data I showed you before, but now I color coded it to match here. As you can see, based on the responsiveness of amurensis at 10C, why we have so much loss in midwinter in amurensis, and we don't see the same loss in riparia. But at the end of the season, when chilling has maximized, 
we're starting to warm up, we start to see the same, same levels of deacclimation. So it starts to make sense with the field data. So another cool observation um, that comes out of this is looking at these three varieties. So Cab Franc and Sauvignon Blanc are two, and Cab Sauvignon, Cabernet Sauvignon, are three varieties that happen to have this pedigree. Cab Franc and Sauv Blanc are the parents of Cab Sauv. And so we have sort of like a local small breeding family to look at. Um, if we look at their response, here's Sauv Blanc at 10 and 22. Here's Cab Franc at 10 and 22. And here's Cab Sauv at 10 and 22. So what's neat about this is it tells us that we really want to be perhaps phenotyping at this warm temperature because we can exaggerate the differences between genotypes. But then comparing it with a, a colder temper, temperature may give us a better idea of what they're doing at different stages. And so we could be selecting for different aspects of the, this trait. The other thing we're doing with deacclimation is the same thing I mentioned in acclimation is that we're collecting data on gene expression. And so as the vine is deacclimating, de we collect bud tissue and do RNA RNA-seq on those samples. And we did this on four different varieties, Riesling, Cabsov, Amurensis, and Riparia. And this is a heat map, which I don't, it looks really washed out, but um, I'm sure you've seen heat maps from gene expression before. Basically, if we look at how time affects us, we have a major group of genes that are upregulated during deacclimation de and a major group of genes that are downregulated. <coughs> Excuse me. When we do pathway enrichment, like which, how many genes are in different pathways? Are there any overrepresented pathways? The one thing that popped out repeatedly in all four varieties is the ABA pathway. And so in the ABA pathway, we have carotenoid biosynthesis leading to xanthoxin, leading to ABA. ABA can then be degraded, signal, or be put in an activation reactivation pool. And if we look at um, how gene expression occurs each day during deacclimation, so that's what these squares are, you can see that biosynthesis is shut down, conversion is shut down, degradation is shut down, signaling is shut down, and the inactive pool is the only thing that is sort of being upregulated. So it's sort of like the vine or the bud is purging ABA. And this makes sense from what we know about the antagonistic aspects of ABA and GA. ABA represses GA. GA is responsible for growth. That's what's happening during deacclimation is a gradual conversion from no growth to growth. So this makes a lot of sense. So what we wanted to do from, and this is by no means complete, this is just like the easiest nugget to show you. Um, what we've done though is we've taken this result and we've moved it into trying to translate this into a viticulture method uh, for growers. And so what we did is we looked at the effect of ABA on the, on the phenotype of deacclimation. So if you look at the normal deacclimation pattern here in yellow, you can see it. over time you lose cold hardiness. If you spray the buds with an ABA spray, you can stop deacclimation and shift this for the, the bud break phenotype by quite, quite a distance here. It's like uh, 30 days. If you look at what that looks like from the, uh, the gross plant look, here on the left is control. Here's one millimolar ABA, five millimolar ABA. You can see that there's a clear suppression of growth and a clear delay relative to control. And the other thing that we're doing is comparing this to methyl jasmine, another stress responsive hormone to see if we could trigger similar pathways with a different plant hormone. And you can see here in five millimolar methyl jasmine and 2.5 millimolar methyl jasmine that we're getting some of the same phenotype, but it's not as extreme as ABA. And so we've, hope, we've dissected the the different aspects of cold hardiness apart with the goal of trying to come up with genes that are important, but then also give growers maybe a field uh, mitigation method should we have warm events in, in late winter. So just to wrap all of this up, um, dormancy, acclimation, maintenance of cold hardiness, and deacclimation are a suite of physiological and genetic traits. It's all very complex. Temperature perception is clearly playing a major role. Uh, we don't know what the temperature, the temperature sensor is in the bud. There's not a lot of actively growing tissue, but something is keeping track of temperature. Um, acclimation is far more complicated than just perceiving an average temperature. temperature. So it's not just colder gives you more acclimation. There's colder and variable temperature swings that gives you acclimation. 
deacclimation and chilling requirement, they appear to be adaptive. Um, and we seem to have a really nice phenotype now for deploying two mapping studies. So one of the problems with grapes is that we don't have, a, if you make a mapping family, you don't have a lot of space for your plants and you don't have a lot of tissue from any one individual. And so this might give us a way to finally start phenotyping because we've narrowed in on something that actually changes in a consistent way. And finally, uh, abscisic acid metabolism seems to play an essential role, both in the acclimation, as I showed you, if you spray with ABA, they gain hardiness, but also in deacclimation, that if you supply ABA, you can halt the acclimation. So I know that was a lot, but um, I will just say thank you for giving me a chance to talk and then open it up to any questions. So have you been able to, I mean, uh, with riparia, is there enough variation out there in the natural ones that you could actually, say in these cold winters, go through and spore depth uh, and, and essentially do a natural association mapping design? So essentially, you go through after a hard winter, you figure out which ones died, and you find 5,000 of them, something like that, go through woods and just then just genotype the live and dead ones. Is that? Is, yeah. So the question was. Google. Could, yeah. So the question was, um, could we basically do a natural selection study, collect a vast amount of vari variable genotypes for riparia, plant them all out, hopefully kill a good chunk of them, and then just well, look for the, the genetic regions that are I'm shared. I'm not sure you need to plant them out. I mean, could you walk through the woods? Can you score the death of riparia in the woods? Not easily, and the. The problem we see with the riparias, so all of those riparias survive here. Okay. Whether they come from Texas or they come from Manitoba, they survive here. So we, and I showed you in the very cold year, we can start pushing things that are cold hardy apart. Your study design might work better if you were to take a whole diversity panel and put it in Manitoba, right? right? Where, we, where we really push up against the adaptive barrier, that 45 degrees or the 40 degree C line. We need that kind of winter. The kind of winters we have just make things messy. We don't, we don't normally see any damage in riparia. Um, we will see it in vinifera, but again, it depends on the year. In some years, we have significant vinifera damage at what would be considered warm temperatures because it was a very mild winter. And so it's just, it's really sticky. But I think you could do it in principle if you put it someplace where you pushed. Go ahead. Um, great talk, thanks a lot. Uh, so in, in genomic prediction, people are trying to um, integrate crop growth models with prediction for things like yields. Um, and you know, it depends on having a very simplified crop growth model so that you only have a few parameters that you think are under genetic control, and then you, you push those through a crop growth model. And I mean, I, I guess, you showed, you showed the various graphs where you're trying to match acclimation and deacclimation. In essence, you're developing a, a winter hardiness model mm -hmm. through your different phases. Um, I mean, do you, do you think you could simplify it, or is it already simplified down to three, four, maybe five parameters that, that each, each you, would, you essentially try to give each um, genotype that you have, each accession, a value for, for you know, three or four parameters, and then push it through that model? So that's the goal. So the, the way the Keller model was developed is similar to what you're saying, in that for each cultivar, you have a, a set of parameters that you just plug and chug, right. given your weather data, like right. you just send it through. With the data that I presented, that's only, we only have it for two varieties, and this is stuff that's come out of Al's um, project. But that's the end goal. So it's, and it's connecting those two pieces, right? Because we, we have, temperature playing a different role in each section, and it's all related to the chill accumulation. So the hope would be that we'd be able to have like a, a parameter that ties to acclimation, a parameter that is measuring the chill accumulation, which is fa fairly standard, it's the temperature range, and then the, the rates of the acclimation. So if you string those together, you should get the curve based on any given year, right? Because it's gonna be dependent on temperature. So we're, we're working towards that. Um, now that we know that it works and it's worth the effort, 
it's actually a fairly simple experiment to go out and do and to collect all the material and then just make the measurements. So you did have these 43 riparian sessions, right? And do you have estimates for at least those 43? The, no, we, the, the important part is to do the growth chamber experiments in both cases. Because the natural variation, there's too much other stuff going on there. And I didn't show here, there's other aspects of like, when the sun is out, the buds are actually warmer than air temperature. At night, the buds drop below air temperature. So like, there's all these other environmental parameters that we need to narrow things in the growth chamber in order to understand how to incorporate them for the field. So for the, for the riparia stuff, we haven't done the controlled like deacclimation studies at different temperatures to get the rates for every, every variety. We only have it for that one that I showed in that, that graph. But that's where we're going to go next, because all of the stuff I started with was using these older cold hardiness curves and, and bud burst assays. And, and frankly, the new methods are a lot, a lot tighter. And so we're going to redo that so that we can actually use those parameters. Go ahead. I'm sorry. One more. <laughs> then you. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, so is there anything that has a bad combination of has to acclimate and slow to deacclimate. If you grow this stuff all of this problem up, deacclimate wakes up too quickly. One, one, one day, and you're starting to step off, very slow, that's one steep. Is there anything wild that has those two combinations? Or is that not beneficial? I really hope so. Um, the acclimation side of things, from, from the comparisons I've done from past stuff, they look like they acclimate roughly at the same rate. So it may be that there's more of a it's a more constant response to temperature on that side of it. That part of the physiology may be more standard. And the deacclimation may be the wiggly part. Um, the rapid acclimation, right now, we're faced with trying to figure out how temperature with certain amplitude gives you certain hardiness. And that actually gets tricky, because as you go down in temperature, it gets harder and harder to actually simulate that winter. Um, so I don't know how far we'll get to figuring out if we can get rapid acclimators. Um, but the hope would be get something that goes down and each year gets you your maximum hardiness. So that means going to sleep early and then your maximum resistance to deacclimation. I think that would be the, the best way forward because we're not going to be able to control winters. And every now and then we're going to have a winter that kills them because it's mild and then we get a polar vortex. I don't really think there's anything we can do to prevent that. So we can just give you the best tools for each year. And you had a question? Well, the nifera is, is grafted onto American rootstock. Yeah. Uh, if you play with the, the rootstock, can you, can you affect one hardiness? Nobody has done a good job of showing that that's possible. So the rootstock could impact cold hardiness from maybe some other ways by controlling vine vigor or by um, controlling sort of like the crop load, contributing to a greater or lesser crop load. And that may have a source sink relationship with, with bud cold hardiness. Tim Martinson is the extension um, viticulturist at Cornell. And he's doing a study right now with the idea of testing the source sink idea. If you dramatically reduce sinks or you dramatically reduce sources, can you influence bud cold hardiness? I don't like no one has shown that a given rootstock will improve the cold hardiness of Riesling by X. Um, and really, I don't know if that's possible. I've never done it, but the bud itself is, is sort of isolated from the root. Part of the, the dormancy process and the hardiness process is sealing itself off from the cane so that ice can't propagate into the bud. And so signals and that kind of stuff that might be coming from the root are going to be difficult to transmit into the bud outside of the growing season. But yeah, no one's done a good systematic job of it. Uh, so oh, sorry. You, you had that the first one to start wins the race thing. Yeah. But meaning you, you, you start to acclimate a couple weeks earlier. Is there a relationship between that and, and yields? Is there, Stopping your photosynthesis right, and that was with riparia data, right? So we haven't, we would have to look to see what the projected dormancy target would be for a vinifera to see how close that would push up against harvest date. Um, 
So with riparia, we're not, we have never, we don't even look at yield because we just don't. We're looking at it more from the hardiness point of view. Um, when they do the studies with ABA and they spray, they spray the vines at brazen, which is the, when the berries start to turn purple, so it's sort of mid season, I guess, they see the effect in the fall with uh, yellowing of leaves, early leaf drop, early entrance into dormancy, but it also ripens the berries faster. So the ABA ripens the berries faster. So it may be possible to select for yields, like earlier ripening phenotype in tandem with a... So I mean, I was actually thinking about yield next year. Oh. oh, okay. Yeah, maybe that's ridiculous, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I mean, it is accumulating photosynthesis that, that are gonna go into growth the next year, right? Okay, maybe. so yeah, so your question is, would, would speeding up entrance into dormancy impact the subsequent year's yeah. harvest. Um, I don't know how much, I guess that's a, that's a great question. I don't know the right answer. I guess we would talk to like a, a fruit load physiologist, right? I don't know how much those late season leaves are contributing to the photosynthate storage where if you were to knock them off a couple weeks early, if you would, I don't think you would, impact inflorescence number because they're already patterned in the buds so i don't i don't know the right answer to that once we figure out the first part then we'll go after that <laughs> on that note um let's thank you this has been a production of cornell university on the web at cornell.edu